Good day, this is Professor Resnick again. Uh, this will be the last and summary lecture of Economics 305. So let me thank right at the start Dan Madsen for uh, these recordings uh, and the job that he's done, as well as uh, the other Dan and Manisha for the work that they've uh, done in preparing this uh, course. And we hope uh, the three of us, four of us, that you all uh, get something out of it and enjoy it. Let me then uh, go back to where I left off um, in the previous lecture. What I'm, um, what I'm trying to do to remind you is tell a story about the Uni United States using um, the class concepts that we have developed in this course. So it's not only a story about the U.S., but it's a review of what we have uh, done. And uh, just to pick up where I left off, um, recall I started with the, the, the entry point of Marxism, that is, in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, that the surplus, so this is the class exploitation in the United States, was not sufficient for all the demands on that surplus, okay, so the right-hand side greater than the left-hand side, because of three key demands. The payment to workers, the payment to the state, and this payment to OPEC. So this was, again, the unequal exchange brought about by unions. Their price of labor power was greater than the unit value, high federal taxes on surplus value, and this new oil shock to the U.S. economy in which um, OPEC formed a cartel um, which allowed it to, to uh, uh, charge a price of energy higher than the unit value. And that meant that the capitalists, other distributions, and in particular that the capital accumulation were being undermined. That was an important uh, 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 condition of the left-hand side of the equation because the left-hand side of the equation, while these are being bumped, the left-hand side of the equation is being diminished because American corporations were losing their, losing super profit. They were losing surplus value to more efficient foreign competitors. So there was, that, that's the example that I presented to you on that tablet, tableau that we presented in, in, in these lectures on the uh, competition amongst the different firms um, within the same industry. So in the automobile industry, the TV industry, and so forth, there was a loss of surplus value, a redistribution of surplus value from the less efficient American to the more efficient uh, foreign competitors, in particular the, J the Japanese competitors. So you can see the left-hand side is being diminished while the right-hand side is being increased. And then as, as I explained, along comes a, a new president um, and a new economics called Reaganomics to help solve this problem. And so the breakup of the unions that diminished uh, the price of labor power, the reduction in corporate taxes, and to go along with it, the reduction of personal taxes, which I'll come to in a moment, um, reduced this, and the deregulation of uh, energy and oil prices in the United States allowed uh, market prices to rise in the United States, which increased the supply of, of energy in the U.S., um, which helped to uh, uh, diminish the power of, of OPEC to set a, this uh, monopoly price. The diminished distributions to these three um, uh, elements on the right-hand side enabled capital accumulation over here to expand. Um, plus, let me add to it another one. R&D, research and development, allowed capital accumulation to expand and new uh, distributions to invent new products and so forth. And what that meant was that American corporations were able to compete more effectively because this yielded a higher composition of capital, remember our lectures now, which in turn raised the productivity of labor, which in turn tended to reduce the average cost of production in the United States, which allowed um, in a variety of different industries, and the automobile industry is, is, is uh, one of the more interesting examples of this, allow the average cost of producing these commodities, these automobiles, uh, steel and so forth, 
to diminish. Remember the average cost now, Z plus V over UV. So the increase in the productivity of labor diminished the, this average cost. And I'm going to give you an argument in a moment that the value of labor power also fell. So there was a dramatic change in the United States, which is both uh, denominator in numer denominator increase, numerator fell. The United States was able then to mount uh, an offensive against these uh, foreign competitors. So it was rather a, a, a striking um, set of proposals um, under President uh, Reagan at the time. So let me pick it up now. Um, I gave you a little bit last time a flavor of the bad news and the good news. That is, um, if you recall, um, the bad news for, the good news is the federal taxes are reduced. Um, that's good news for the capitalists. The bad news is that the state is going to start running a deficit, which is with us till, until today. The good news of destroying the unions or eroding their power is that this is reduced, but the bad news for the capitalists is that the workers have uh, less income to purchase the uh, commodities that the capitalists are producing. So let me start with this one, and then let me pick up the rest. If you're going to diminish wages, then if nothing else changes, that's going to constrain consumption, that's going to constrain the effective demand for wage goods produced by the capitalists, and that's going to make it perhaps, not necessarily, difficult for the capitalists um, to realize the value of their uh, goods uh, because demand is being diminished. There's no necessity for that because demands from other uh, subsumed classes are rising in the economy and there's exports, and, but nonetheless there's a tension here. So here's an argument of why this tension did not arise, why consumption did not fall, in fact it increased. So let me write this down here. We have consumption is equal to the income of the workers. So this is consumption of the workers, income of the workers, and this is their value per labor hour times the labor hours times the H. So that's the, this is the V, of, of the total V. Va once again, reviewing what we've done, the value wage per labor hour times the number of laborers times H. Plus debt, because workers can consume more if they go into debt minus taxes. This is the taxes that workers pay to the, um, um, to the federal government. Okay? Well, let me put one more in because it is important here. Um, plus the subsumed class revenue that the workers received. Okay, th that is just too messy, so let me get rid of this. plus the subsumed class revenue that the workers received from their unions, plus the debt, minus the taxes. Okay, so here's the argument. Now I'm going to add this back in so we can tell our story. This became diminished over time because of the uh, uh, attack upon unions starting with this air controller strike in 1981. So in effect, this fell um, to zero. That is, the price of labor power was diminished. I shall come back to that in a moment, but just let me make this argument here. Okay. I'm going to give you an argument in a moment why the value, the wage per labor hour fell. So you can see, if, if there's nothing else changing, this is pushing consumption down. If wages are falling, and if the extra price of labor power that those workers are getting is falling, we have a falling consumption. However, employment rose, even if there was no change in the length of the workday, employment rose, debt increased, and taxes fell. So part of this new strategy was to starve the federal government of taxes, first with the reduction in corporate taxes, but then the reduction in personal taxes, which affects this equation. So this, this is the personal taxes that the workers pay. That was cut. Not to get the tax bill through Congress, if you're going to cut corporate taxes for the wealthiest segments of the population, the corporations, you're going to have to cut personal taxes along with that. This was cut. Debt took off, as you all know. 
and employment took off. But that's the the expansion and capital accumulation in our language. K star plus lambda rose, and that was in part it, that was in part because of this redistribution of um, of, uh, of the uh, uh, demands on the surplus away from OPEC, the federal government, and uh, uh, the, u the unions to raise K star, raise Lambda, research and development, capital accumulation, and hence employment grew. So consumption did not fall, and this is one might have expected because of the cut in wages. Uh, both on the, on the side of, the, uh, uh, of unionized workers and then the fall in little v, which I'll come to in a moment, but consumption rose over this time, financed by reduction in taxes, increase in debt, and a growth in employment. Okay? So let me now uh, uh, come to this, which I keep mentioning to you, this uh, cut in the value of labor power. That is the little value of labor power, value per labor hour. In order to do that, I would like to introduce, again, the um, labor market in the United States over these years. So let me put on the blackboard the graph for the labor market. Here is the, I'll put the real wage of workers, and here is the demand and supply of workers, of their labor power. So here is the supply, and here's the demand, okay, for labor power. First, I'll put this in a different color, and I'll, I'll, I'll dot it. This price of labor power, I'll put this in real terms. So the, the unions have been bargaining for a higher real wage for their uh, uh, members. This was, this power was eroded by President Reagan and Congress. That was part of this Reaganomics that was elected to office. So the blue line is broken. The, the, in, in industry after industry, the major industries in the United States, over time, the w unions have their power to set that blue price of labor power gets eroded. Hence, what happens is that the market approaches a more free market, free of the monopoly power uh, now of, of the unions, and so the price as you can see, because I just erased it, the price has a tendency to fall. Okay? While that is occurring, so let's do that, let's put it here. Number one, so you, you have reduced union power, and that has its impact in this market by reducing the price of labor power in real terms. Number two, while that's going on, from what I just said in a moment ago, the demand for labor power is shifting to the right. I'll put that in a dotted line there. And the reason it's shifting to the right is because of capital accumulation is occurring in the United States. Okay, so and, and that goes back to what I just mentioned to be, be before the, the the corporations now do expand their capital accumulation as you reduce the. The, the payments they have to make to uh, uh, these three groups on the right-hand side, including the reduction in federal taxes. They can redistribute their surplus to expand capital accumulation, and employment grows, as we just talked about, it having its impact on consumption. Okay, So one might think, okay, that's a tendency for the real wage to rise. But at the same time, the supply of labor power, okay, so you might expect this, to be in the new real price of, of the new real wage, but at the same time, the supply of labor power shifts to the right, and hence we end up with a new kind of equilibrium that looks a little bit like this. Let me do this in blue. I did it too dramatically, but you get the idea. Here, the real wage actually then begins to fall in the United States. And actually, if, to do it properly, it, it was up here, and so the fall was by eroding the union power. You know, we started out here, and we ended up over here after all these different shifts and changes in the labor power market. This is where we started, this is where we end up. So the, 
shift to the right in the supply of labor power overwhelmed the shift into the right for the, the demand for labor power. And the reasons there are interesting and fascinating, complex, and there will be entire courses. Number two is an increase in the, a shift in the supply of labor power to the right because of women entering the labor force. And in part, only in part, women increasingly enter the labor force because their spouses or partners real wage has diminished. And hence to maintain the family income, it requires another member of that family besides the male to sell, in this case, her labor power in the market to supplement that, that income so that they can afford um, the standard of living with, to which they have been accustomed for so many decades. Be that as it may, that shift in the supply puts downward pressure on the wage. Secondly, the supply increases because of immigration. So into the United States during this period of time comes waves of legal and illegal immigrants, which puts downward pressure also on the, puts downward pressure on the price of labor market as they um, uh, come into the labor force taking a variety of different kinds of, of jobs. First low paying jobs, but then moving up the scale to more high paying jobs. Third, it's true that demand for labor power shifts to the right, as I explained before, but the shift is not as, as robust as one might expect because there's an increase in the composition of capital that we have discussed in the course. So the index of mechanization rises, and that's got something to do with the computer revolution. So you, you, the, the U.S. economy doesn't employ as many people as one might expect from a robust case star plus lambda because the composition of capital is changing. More and more of the capital, C plus V, is composed by the value of machines. So you have these dramatic effects in the U.S. economy, which is pushing down the real wage. Okay, so let me erase this and let me then go back to that real wage. Recall, the value of labor power for all the workers now is equal to the exchange value per unit use value times unit, remember the use value. And this component right here is what economists call the real wage. Well, I think the argument I gave you over this period of time is that the real wage is falling for American workers. So this is being pushed down. Now it is true at the same time, the unit value of wage goods is falling as well. So that's a strong argument for the value of labor power falling in the United States. Okay? I think what happened, this is my interpretation of what happened here. I think the real wage starts to fall for American workers, blue collar workers. Okay? And I think that American workers start to become, um, start to accept a new norm, a new standard, which is a lower real wage for themselves. So for the first time in, in uh, U.S. history, for a prolonged period of time, the real wage falls. And in connecting that to our Marxist argument, I think that fall on the real wage produces a, this is Marx now, produces a changed moral and historical uh, uh, standard in American society in which the workers come to accept a lower real wage. Now I understand their acceptance of this is overdetermined by a variety of different things, not the least of which is they're continually being told that they have to uh, uh, cut their wage to be more competitive, otherwise American jobs are going to move overseas. So the global economy acts as a powerful force um, pushing workers to accept a lower standard of living. Number one. Number two, their unions have been eroded. So the, the unions are not uh, there in the workplace um, to, to uh, uh, bargain for higher real wages. Moreover, in, in many of these industries, the unions themselves are complexly uh, shaped by this message because of global competition. Um, they have to accept a lower real wage in order to save the jobs of the uh, workers. And of course, the federal government then with this picked up by the media and, and professors of economics and so forth, give the message that American workers have to come to accept this lower real wage so that we can survive in a global economy. 
So, I mean, the, the, the politics change, the culture change, the economics change, and hence, I think what happens that this lower real wage becomes normalized, and then in Marxian language, the value of labor power falls, as, long, as well as the unit value of wage goods continue to fall because of a higher productivity of labor. Remember, we did that. The higher productivity is a lower unit value of wage goods. And a, a very important um, uh, factor shaping this one is cheap wage goods in China. That is, China becomes a major producer of cheap wage goods, which are produced there, exported to the United States, which enables the wage goods to fall, okay, which in that sense offsets a degree the necessity for the real wage to fall because workers can go to Walmart and purchase these cheaper wage goods. So if you put them together, we have the value of labor power falling in the United States, and bango, we have then <laughs> what I just said to you. We have the average cost being pushed down because of a rise in productivity and the denominator, rise in the composition of capital, blah, 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 a reduction in the value of labor power, the United States becomes a relatively cheap place to produce commodities around the world. Okay? And so it's a recovery in industry, after, not in every industry, obviously, but it's a recovery in a number of industries in the US, and that diminishes our loss of surplus value to our foreign uh, competitors. Let me just then put all this, if I may, together in one kind of uh, summary super diagram, okay, from what we have said. And the following diagram um, has become uh, relatively well known because of a, a good comrade of mine and a friend for many, many years has gone across the United States and Europe as well, and he has presented this. This is uh, Richard Wolff. Uh, the diagram is as follows, okay? And this is a diagram that Rick and I produced um, in an article for this journal, Rethinking Marxism, some years ago, just a couple of years ago. I'm going to plot here two things, the real wage of American workers, so this is the United States, and the productivity of American workers in industry. So this is the real wage in industry the productivity in industry, in manufacturing, okay? And this is over time on the horizontal axis. So I'm going to start with roughly the 1880s in the United States, and all these numbers come from the U.S. Uh, the government. They're all published numbers. And I'm going to go right up to the present. The productivity of American workers has steadily increased. In fact, starting roughly 1981, it kind of increases even more. Okay? So there's been a sustained increase in the productivity of American workers. That's what capitalism can deliver. Okay? A rise in the composition of capital, uh, new managerial techniques, and so forth. Everything that Marx described that you have read in volume one is reproduced around the world, and in this example, reproduced in the United States, and the productivity of labor rises. That's a great gain from capitalism. It develops, in Marxian language, the forces of production. The result is we get more wealth in the numerator with the same or even less um, labor power, means of uh, 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 workers times the hours that they work. Now let me put here the real wage. Over our history, the real wage kind of looks like this. So over a long period of time, I haven't drawn this uh, properly because this is 100 years, but all, uh, in, it, over the entire 100 years of our great industrialization after the Civil War, it's not just the productivity rose. But the real wages ro of American workers rose as well over a 100-year span, a ra rather remarkable um, phenomenon. That rise in real wage financed a rising consumption for American workers. And in many ways, it became the envy of the world, attracting immigrants into the United States. Obviously, they didn't come only for, the, for, for a higher standard of living. They also came for the freedoms 
that American uh, capitalism promised individuals. But be that as it may, this rise in the real wage and the consumption that it enabled helped to support, helped to uh, make, I should even say, make stronger than support, helped to make the American dream, okay? which is a rising consumption over a lot longer period of time. So in Marxian lingo, to go back, okay, we have the value of labor power equal to the exchange value per unit use value times the real wage. Well, the argument here is that this real wage is rising. Okay, that's the red line over this long period of time. The productivity of labor is rising, that's the black line, and that's pushing this down, okay? So remember now what we did in the beginning of the course. A rise in the productivity of labor means it takes fewer abstract labor hours to produce commodities. And so the unit value falls. And my guess is that the fall in the unit value was greater than the rise in the real wage. And hence, the value of labor power fell over time. And that means that the surplus rose. So I think that part of the success story of American capitalism is a rising rate of exploitation. Okay? It's, it's the connection of this story I told you about productivity and real wage to the rate of exploitation that is Marx's message. Okay? That's precisely what is missing from the stories of American capitalism, which is what Economics 305 and Marxism adds. It's this connection here. So, the, the re higher real wage and the fall in the V, and therefore the higher in the rate of exploitation, in, in, a, in a sense, if I can just summarize this, in a sense there's no revolt in the United States. There's no widespread uh, revolt, in part because the higher real wage compensates for the higher rate of exploitation. So capitalism delivers a higher real wage and a higher consumption, which helps to offset the rise in the rate of exploitation, okay? along with uh, uh, a variety of other mechanisms which overdetermines the inability of socialism um, to, to mount any kind of sustained presence in the United States, not the least of which is the idea of American exceptionalism, which is the United States delivers not only a higher standard of living, but also all the freedoms associated with a free market uh, system. That too has an important role to play. 1981, things change. Okay? For the first time in U.S. history, this real wage stops rising. It kind of looks something like this. It actually falls a bit, right up to the present. Okay? So we have something new after 1981, okay? and this is reflected in the solution to that crisis that I started this lecture with and talked about last time, which is because of changes in the labor market, because of this attack up upon unions, because of a changed kind of uh, a culture in the U.S. in which workers are willing to accept a lower real wage, this no longer rises. So we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have now, I'm going to rewrite it over here, the value of labor power. So this is before this is 1880s. The 1981, roughly. This is 1981, you know, to 2000, let's say eight. Now the real wage is constrained, and it actually even falls just a little bit. So for the first time in U.S. history. Again, because of the changes that we talked about, the real wage is not rising. It's actually, at best, constant, and it actually falls a little bit for the American worker. So we have a wage depression for almost, you know, almost 40 years in the United States. Not to mention, not, no one really talks about it. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a remarkable uh, uh, fact that this decline in the real wage of workers compared to the rising real wage prior to the 1980s, prior to President Reagan, is a remarkable change in the United States, which draws very, not too much analysis. At the same time, 
this continues to fall in part because of these cheap Chinese wage goods, but also the, the continual rise in the productivity of labor. Hence, the S over V kind of takes off in the United States this time around because of the decline in the real wage added to this decline in the unit value of wage goods. So this is a dramatic increase in the rate of exploitation in the United States, which in a sense you can see from the rising gap between the black and the red lines. Okay? What this says is this is this rising S over V. Okay? Now, because of the historical importance of rising consumption to the workers, because that be part, becomes part of the American uh, dream and the American exceptionalism, the workers for over this period do not cut their consumption. What happens is two dramatic things. You would say, well, they've got to cut their consumption. No. What happens is that consumption more or less continues like this. Consumption continues to rise. This is consumption. Okay. Despite the fact that the real wages they receive doesn't warrant this. And the reason why consumption rises for, for workers are two. Number one, everybody in the family goes to work. So mommy, daddy, grandpa, grandma, and so forth, everybody in the, farm, in the family starts to sell their labor power. And what becomes more and more important in the United States is the family wage. Even though the individual wage of mommy and daddy are falling, as mommy gets into the labor force, she's too receiving a, a, a lower uh, real wage because of what I mentioned to you before, changes in the labor market. Okay. The family wage rises because everybody's working and that helps to maintain this consumption standard which is so important to the American families, number one. Number two, debt. The second one is that everybody seems to go into debt to help finance the higher consumption. Okay. So as you can see from this, the, that everybody working and going into debt helps to maintain this so that the blue line is above the red line. The red line, again, is the, the, the real wages. So the real wages are constrained, if not falling. Productivity continues to rise. And the consumption of the workers are financed um, increasingly by debt, and of course, as I said, everybody working. Okay, so that's one way to capture what has gone on. And you know, the consequences of this, I'm going to come back and I'm going to end to the consequences, but one of which, of course, is, is, is the debt per capita takes off in the United States, and that's going to pr produce a disaster um, after 2008. The United States economy becomes increasingly fr fragile, sensitive to this rising debt, and sensitive to everybody in the family working, as we shall see. Okay? Just staying with this for a moment, there's another interesting thing to say about this fan which is opening here, which is, okay, let's see. If the surplus is just exploding in the United States because now the value of labor power is falling because of the fall in the unit value and the fall of the real wage, that means that capitalists have more to distribute. Don't forget our equation. Okay, so this is the, you know, the workers take their labor power, they go out and buy uh, uh, consumer goods. The surplus value received by the capitalists, which is exploding, enables the capitalists to make all kinds of distributions. To whom? Well, to all occupants of subsumed class positions. Who, are, who might they be? Well, those are people who get cuts of the surplus, that's their subsumed class revenue. Who are these people? These are the managers, the owners, um, the landlords, the merchants, um, bankers, did I say bankers? These people are getting increased, are increasingly getting more higher cuts of this exploding surplus to supply their conditions of existence. So if I take the ratio of this to the workers' value of labor power plus their former subsumed class revenues that they got from their unionized position. If I take just this ratio and talk about it in terms of this period after the 1980s, what do we have? Well, look, we have this one going to zero. That's the attack 
That's the attack on unions, the reduction in the price of labor power, and so forth. We have now a diminished V. So the denominator in this fraction is falling. At the same time, the numerator is rising. Why? Because the reduction in the value of labor power and now allows more surplus, relative surplus value, allows more surplus, which can then be distributed to whom? To the top managers of the corporation, to the owners of the stock, to the bankers, to the, to, you know, to the owners of Walmart, and so forth. And so you have a rising ratio of the incomes in the numerator to the occupants of subsumed class positions and a falling income to the workers. And all of a sudden, Americans begin to recognize a radically changed income distribution. So this is reflected in the changed income distribution that everyone wants to talk about, or a lot of people want to talk about in the United States. The U.S. income distribution tends to become more and more unequal. More and more of the total income is going to people in the numerator. A smaller portion of the American income is going to people in the denominator. So the income distribution in the states becomes more uneven over time, during this period of time, and it begins to resemble what it was uh, prior to the 1920s. You know, it, it, it's about as unequal now as it may have been in 1917 or, or whatever. And this has dramatic consequences in the United States. For example, this uneven distribution of income as a result of what we have described is also reflected in a bifurcation of consumption in the United States. What that means is that the consumption of the workers in, in the uh, denominator becomes constrained other than debt and everybody in the family working, okay? So people in the, um, in the denominator are struggling to maintain their consumption, buying their Chevrolet, going to buy their shirts at Walmart and so forth, whilst at the same time people in the numerator are expanding their consumption, you, you know, perhaps at levels not seen since the, the 1880s and, and, and 1890s. So you have what you have in the numerator are people who are buying these monster homes in the United States with three or four of these expensive cars and, and, and so forth. Okay, so you have this bifurcation, as I said, of consumption in the United States. The consumption of the workers gets constrained, whereas the consumption of the uh, richer elements in society kind of takes off, reflecting the change, the distribution of income, reflecting in turn this remarkable change in the rate of exploitation in the United States. So what, what we're trying to do again is to connect this changed income distribution, changed consumption pattern in the United States to the changed class structure. Final two points and we're going to end on this, okay? There are two other major consequences of uh, what has occurred during this period of time, and I'd like to bring them to your attention, although we're not going to uh, analyze them in any detail, but they're interesting. Um, they're affecting everybody's lives in the United States. They're very current, and so hence, I want to end 305 on that note. There's a crisis in the state, okay? If I just take to the state for a moment, the, this is, I'm just talking about not the federal government, And if we look at their revenues and their expenditures, we have the subsumed class revenues, which are from corporate taxes. Then we have the state collecting non-class revenues on everybody else. So this is the corporate tax. This is the personal tax. So the corporate tax would be the tax on surplus value. Okay, so the, the, once again, to review what we've done, the capitalists have to take a cut of their surplus and they have to uh, pay a tax to the state and the state in turn supplies the capitalists, um, the exploiting capitalists with key conditions of existence, money supply, defense, private property, and so forth. But then the state also taxes everybody else. That's not a subsumed class revenue because everybody else are not appropriators of surplus, and hence they don't have any surplus to distribute to the state. So these would be, for example, mostly the wage workers, but all kinds of, remember now, unproductive labor as well. It's not just that the productive labor gets taxed, but unproductive labor gets taxed. By definition, 
the productive and unproductive laborers are not appropriators of surplus. Okay, that was a couple of lectures that we presented. So only the productive capitalists are producing the, the productive capitalists have the surplus produced by these productive laborers. Okay. The expenditures on the right hand side, so this is the revenues from the state. The expenditures on the right hand side would be all the expenditures that the state makes to help support the private capitalists, plus the expenditures that the state makes to help support all these non-class revenues, that the personal taxes that people pay. Okay. Defense expenditures, swimming pools and education for the public, welfare, welfare for the workers, welfare for the industrial capitalists, the farm subsidy, for example, and all kinds of other subsidies given to capitalists. What happens starting in the 1980s again, to go back where we started, the corporate taxes get cut dramatically. Personal taxes get cut dramatically. So starting with President Reagan, there's a tax reduction which occurs, which is supposed to stimulate capitalism in the way that we described, and it, 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 it does. There's no question that it does that. So it, it, you get a cut in the left-hand side, revenues fall. At the same time, expenditures rise. That is, defense expenditures rise. And you have then a inequality emerging, that is deficits emerging, because you're reducing the left-hand side. At the same time, you're, you're increasing this. And then people begin to, and no one's going to cut the defense budget. Clinton does cut, President Clinton does cut it a bit, but it quickly resumes its normal rise over time. And those are, once again, those are tanks and airplanes and so forth that the capitalists produce and sell to the federal government. And so a struggle emerges over these Y goods. And you know, to, some, to just uh, uh, make this much more simple than what it is, the Republicans argue you've got to cut this. The Democrats argue you can't cut. You've got to maintain this, if not increase. So you have emerging a struggle in Congress right up into the present, which is the two parties argue about this and they ignore the rest because they, they both accept this cut in taxes to finance a rising expenditures. And so you, know, you have deficits. It's not surprising. Deficits emerge from this kind of configuration of revenues and, and, and expenditures. And the deficits that emerge, what, that, what does that mean? The federal government increasingly issues bonds to finance this deficit. So the state gets out of control. There is a crisis in the state which emerges, which continues in a variety of different ways right up to the present. The crisis gets to be uh, not as severe um, under President Clinton because he, Bush won and then President Clinton, they begin to raise taxes and they begin to cut this defense expenditures. But that's the first time this occurs over this 40 year period. And hence that surplus that the government uh, started to rise, which helped to reduce the deficit, that's eliminated by Bush II's uh, tax cuts, and then the increase, continued increase in expenditures. So these deficits, as I said, continue. The state is out of control. So that's, I don't want to lose the big picture now. The 19, uh, early 1980s start, like late 70s uh, end, with a crisis in American capitalism. One strategy to deal with a crisis is to get the capitalists to uh, increase their distributions of surplus to capital accumulation, give them more surplus in the ways that I'm describing by reducing the value of labor power. That worked. That was enormously successful. American capitalism begins to recover, employment grows, and so forth. The crisis of capitalism, which is solved, is displaced upon the state because the state absorbs this strategy of cutting taxes, increasing defense expenditures and other kinds of expenditures, and you get the struggle here between Republicans and Democrats over these public goods right up to the present. Okay? So the deficits rise, 
And a, one consequence of the deficit is that if the state starts to issue more and more bonds to finance this deficit, then you know supply and demand. The price of bonds start to fall. Interest rates start to rise in the United States. Then the very rise in interest rates will choke off, the, <laughs> if it continues, can, can uh, contribute to a choking off of the recovery. We, did this, we this, did this in 305. Because now you have a subsumed class payment on the part of industrial capitalists, which has to arise, which, which will rise, which is rising interest rates uh, paid to the uh, bankers for the capitalists getting access to loans to expand their businesses, uh, to buy other companies, and so forth. And that expansion in interest can constrain the recovery. Also, in workers who are in debt to purchase their homes, to finance the college education for their kids, for their automobiles, for their household appliances, typically, as we have said, go into debt to, to, to maintain their consumption with their cut in wages. Well, those individuals are facing then higher interest payments um, on, that, on that debt. And that, too, is going to constrain their expenditures in a different way, but to constrain it, just like the industrial capitalists. Hence, you've got the possibility of a recession looming because of the very rise in interest rates, because of the rise in deficit, because of the cut in taxes and the increase in expenditures by the state to help solve the capitalist problem. It, it's a little bit out of control, isn't it? The, the solution to capitalism creates then this danger to to capitalism. And hence, the Fed would have to step in if they're going to maintain low interest rates, which in turn has all of its uh, repercussions on the U.S. economy, including the risk of inflation. The second one, besides the state being out of control, um, is this crisis also gets displaced onto households across the United States. And this, let me, I'm going to end on that note. What goes on inside households? Okay, well, a variety of different laboring occurs inside households, as you all know. Um, food preparing and cooking and cleaning and child rearing and bookkeeping and uh, you know, education of children and uh, uh, repairing of goods and services, nurturing, and, and, you know, and so forth, et cetera, as well as sleeping and you know, a variety of other labor processes occur. Within the households, many of these labor processes and the wealth, the household wealth that they produce, have historically been the province of women. Okay? That is changing um, in a variety of countries, including the U.S., but historically, including during this period of time, more or less, they are uh, produced inside the household uh, by women. So women okay, spend time inside the household doing these labor process. But now let's make use of this course. They also engage in a class process inside the household, which is they spend time uh, producing uh, uh, meals for themselves, but then they spend some extra time producing meals um, for, for their spouse or partner. They spend time uh, cleaning the house for themselves. That's their necessary labor, but then they spend labor above and beyond that, an extra labor, a surplus labor, cleaning the house um, for their, their uh, spouse uh, and, uh, or partner. So in other words, women are doing necessary and surplus labor within the household. And then we actually now have numbers on that. The Bureau of Labor Statistics has a household survey. And women spend, uh, you know, 40 hours, and some people when they do estimates even more, 40 hours for seven days a week doing this kind of, of labor which includes this necessary and surplus labor, very similar to what we just we did um, weeks ago in, in this course when we presented it. Increasingly, women entered the labor force, recall, to supplement the diminished real wage of their male partner. Women entered the labor force selling their labor power, which they always had done, but it was especially in times of war in the States. But now, increasingly, women took not just part-time jobs, but full-time jobs outside the household to, in part, to supplement the reduced real wage of their partner. Now, I, I keep emphasizing in part because I don't want to reduce this just to economics. There were also important cultural and political changes in the United States which pushed women out of the labor force, not the least of which was the women's liberation movement in the 1960s and the long struggle of women uh, for rights 
you know, from even before the turn of the uh, turn of the last century onward. Okay. So we had e political and cultural and these economic changes. Women entered the labor force, but, but they're entering the labor force. They're now selling their labor power outside the home, while many of them, according to the Bureau of Labor St Statistics, continue to do necessary and surplus labor inside the household. So what we have for, I would guess, the majority, vast majority of households in the United States, we have women doing necessary labor and surplus labor inside households. They continue to do that. So they continue to hold that job inside the household, producing all kinds of household wealth to maintain themselves, their children, and their husbands. At the same time, they're doing necessary labor and surplus labor outside the household. Again, because of what capitalism has brought, as well as these other cultural and political changes that I mentioned. But at least capitalism also, in part, pushes them to sell their labor power outside the household. Well, let's assume that it takes, I don't know, let's say eight hours a day to sleep and to maintain your body. Okay, that is what I have in mind here is you need um, um, so many hours to sleep to refresh your body. Uh, you need so many hours to wash and to eat and so forth, etc. Let's just, you know, not preparing the meal, but just actually sitting down and eating it. So let's assume that that's eight. So I have 24 minus eight. There's 16 hours available. If this is eight hours over here inside the household, if this is eight hours outside the household, my God, there's no hours left. That is the free time, I'll call it R, the residual, the free time, which would be time what? Time relaxing, watching a little television, listening to music, reading a book, you know, talking to your, 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 your neighbors or whatever. That free time, in effect, gets constrained because women have to go outside the household to sell their labor power to supplement their husband's declining real wage. And so what we have in the United States is an Im literally an impossibility. The solution to the capitalist crisis, it not only gets displaced upon the state and a crisis emerges there, but you get a crisis across households in the United States. The families suffer severe strains because everybody in the family is working. And hence, when husband and wife come home from a full day outside the household to a place inside the household in which traditionally she was the preparer of these meals and washing for him, she doesn't literally have enough time to do all this. This is completely squeezed. She begins to cut into her sleep time to make more time available here. He wants his surplus in the form of meals and washing and so forth, etc. And it becomes even more important because his real wage is being cut, so the household becomes an even more important place of consumer goods uh, for him to offset the constrained consumption out of the household. Well, you've got a recipe for a disaster here. As he puts pressure on her to continue to produce surplus, and as she says, look at, I mean, what do you want from me? I'm working a full time amount here. I don't have any time for myself. Okay, and you want me now to add even more hours producing this stuff, you get increased tension and if not violence within the household. So what we have is, and I'm not reducing it again, what I'm arguing here, the stress and strains of the household overdetermine the breakup of households, the divorce rate in the United, uh, United States. I'm not reducing that to obviously economics, but all I'm arguing here is that the capitalism outside the household has an impact on what goes on inside the household as, lo as well as what goes on inside the state. And so what you have across the United States is a, a, a frustration and anger and an upset emerging from capitalism itself. But no one or very few people explain to the individuals that their problems, their at home, their problems at the job, their, their debt that they're in and so forth is connected 
to the class structure of the United States. So that is one of the important messages of Economics 305. I hope you have enjoyed this course and I hope you continue to read in the Marxian uh, literature. Thank you very much. This is Professor Resnick.